Greetings in Christ's name to First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, on the 16th Sunday after Pentecost for our 9 a.m. service of morning prayer and communion. We welcome you to First Church. No matter who you are or where you are on your journey, you're welcome here at First Church. I'm, in, I'm joined today by music minister Kevin Jones and director of Christian education Mark Williams. Tim Ahrens will join us later for the, um, the time of a sermon later as he is recovering from a hip replacement a few weeks ago. So we continued um, well wishes for his recovery. Today we join with churches around Ohio uh, as a call from the Ohio Council of Churches to bring attention to an the, the anti-racism work that we all need to do in our own lives and in our, in our church's lives and in our community. And so we uh, raise that awareness to you that you may find resources um, through um, things that we have posted. Uh, you'll hear more about that in the sermon today. If you're interested in membership, in learning more about deepening your connection with this faith community at First Church, please let us know. Write in the chat box or email us at the church so that we can be in touch with you. A new member class is forming, and so if you're interested, please let me know. Friends, we turn our hearts and minds to this time of prayer and song and communion. We will have communion later in the service, so if you have uh, bread and juice or other elements that are common to your family, please have those available that you may join in on communion later in the service. Let us turn our hearts to God. Send out your light and your truth that they may lead me and bring, and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. O God, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Praise to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us read responsively the psalm of the day from Psalm 105 in your bulletins. We give you thanks, O God, and call upon your name. We make known your deeds among the peoples. We sing to you. We sing your praise and speak of all your marvelous works. We glory in your holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek you rejoice. We search for you. We remember the marvels you have done, the wonders and the judgments of your mouth. We, the offspring of Abraham, your servant, we, the children of Jacob, the chosen ones. You led out your people with silver and gold. In all their tribes there was not one that stumbled. Egypt was glad of their going, because they were afraid of them. You spread out a cloud for the covering and a fire to give light in the night season. They ask and quail to you, and you satisfied them with bread from heaven. You opened the rock, and water flowed, and the river ran in the dry places. For you remembered your holy word, and Abraham your servant. So you led forth your people with gladness, your chosen with shouts of joy. You gave your people the land of the nations, 
that they might keep your statutes and observe your laws. Hallelujah. People of God, we reconcile ourselves to each other and to God by passing the peace of Christ. The peace of God always be with you and, and also, also with, with you. you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. So, if you remember last week, we talked about the banner and all the different things about being the church. And I said that um, we would talk about reject racism. And racism is a big word. So I brought a book today to help us learn. Okay, and parents, this is a great book and there'll be information on the Facebook and YouTube site where you can get this book. Okay, so let's read this book. This is a book about racism, for reals, and yes, it's really for kids. It's a good book to read with a grown-up, because you'll have lots of, to talk about afterwards. Now to introduce myself. My name is Jelani. My skin color looks like this, because my dad is black and my mom is white, which makes me mixed, or African-American, biracial, black, or a person of color. I'm proud of who I am and the color of my skin, but because of my skin color, people aren't always nice to me. Sometimes I get called names, other times it's worse. The person doing it might even realize that it hurts me a lot. And when they treat me that way, it makes me feel, can you see that, small. You see, some people believe that having different color skin means you aren't as good as others. That's called racism. What is racism? Racism means to hate someone, exclude them, or treat them badly because of their race or the color of their skin. It happens all the time. Not just in big ways, but sometimes it shows up in small ways. Sometimes invisible, like a look, a comment, a question, a thought, a word, or a belief. Racism is one of the worst kinds of mean someone can be because racism thinks being different is bad. But being different is actually good. Like really, 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 I'm almost done. Really, 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 really good. 1,000% good. Because being different means we have so much more to offer each other. Things like help, ideas, strength, skills, creativity, life, patience, respect, community, love, knowledge, experience, perspective, insight, diversity, wisdom, empathy, and originality. Those are a lot of big words. That whole being different thing, it makes us better, much better. So if you see someone being treated badly, made fun of, excluded from playing, or looked down on because of their skin color. Call it what it is, racism. And again, this is a wonderful book. And I hope that you all will get a chance to see this book again. Racism and our church, being a church, we reject racism. And I hope that you'll talk to your parents more about this, okay? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, help us to reject racism. Help us to invite 
Help us to embrace all of us that are different. Because being different is a good thing. In your son's precious name, amen. See you next week. A reading from the book of Jonah, chapter 3. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, Is it better for me to die than to live? But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor, and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night, and it perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 20. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for their usually daily wage, he sent them to his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. You did, not agree, did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God. It's good to be back. Uh, I'm pre-recording this again for the 9 a.m. service. I'm going to be live from here on out. But I wanted you guys to know that I'm sending you my love today. I'm recording this in the sanctuary, so uh, it's going to be a little different look than you're used to. But I'm uh, coming along. Uh, a month ago, I was coming out of surgery. Uh, today, I'm coming along great. So look, would you join me in prayer as we turn our hearts and minds to God? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. There is no more cherished word in the Christian faith than grace. 
Simply defined, grace describes the mercy of God demonstrated in countless ways to undeserving people. Grace is completely unmerited. It is free. It is difficult for most of us to grasp and it is difficult for many to accept. It often gets sweetened like saccharine sweetness and becomes divorced from its connectedness to God's righteousness and God's action in the midst of it. Nothing jars the sentimentality of grace like the parable that we just heard from the Gospel of Matthew in the 20th chapter, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Speaking to his disciples while instructing them as they move from the peaceful setting on the Sea of Galilee to the tumultuous battleground of Jerusalem, Jesus offers this insider story for all of us to hear. It's about divine grace. Attempting to teach that the last shall be first and the first shall be last, Jesus tells this story of laborers. They've all been paid the same day's wage for vastly different hours of labor. For those who have worked from sun up, 6 a.m. to sundown, 6 p.m., they're paid four denarius. That would be about $80 in today's money. Now, you must bear in mind in the first century, unskilled workers and soldiers were both paid the same. They were paid one denarius for a day's work. That's $10 a day. So four denarius would have been four times the common daily wage. So these guys working 12-hour shift are already being paid four times as much. But the story goes on. Those who work from 9 a.m. and noon and even 5 p.m. till closing time, that's nine hours, six hours, and one hour, are also paid for denarius. When pay for the day comes, those who have worked 12 hours react very badly. We are all being paid the same, they say, and the owner responds, I paid you a fair day's wages. The wage I promise to pay you. Furthermore, what I do with my money, it's my business. They are right. It's not fair. The other guy's getting paid as much as they did for a lot less work. That's true. But he is right. It's his money. He can do with it what he wants to. End of story. Or is it? While we all know that wage theft is a real thing in our time, while we all know that there are two to three million laborers here in America that are paid less than minimum wage and they're exploited as laborers, this is a story of wage fairness and wage extravagance. Everyone is paid well, four times the minimum wage. Some are treated like a day laboring king with the pay they receive. So how do we get a hold of this? The truth is we can't. It's just grace. It's grace. We can't explain it any other way. The grumblers are not really against grace. They just don't like that grace is shown so extravagantly to others. We see that in lots of ways in our daily lives, don't we? A person will come into our school or come into our workplace and we see the boss or we see the teacher treat them really well. I, I've seen this as well. We assume that they like them better than they like us, right? Oh, they're new here, so everybody likes them. Some folks grumble that the pastor pays so much more attention to the new people than those of a certain age, those who've been around forever, that the pastor likes small groups over here, but not really my group over here. The grumbling goes on, doesn't matter what the context is. Is it possible that grace is actually abounding everywhere? Is it possible that the free and unmerited love and welcome, that extravagant care is actually felt and extended to everyone? Following the Jesus way of practicing radical love and hospitality for all, that's all, not some, all. Time and time again, the stories of Scripture point us to the ways of love and welcome, point us to the ways of grace. And we don't always like grace for others. We love it for ourselves. Well, that brings us to Jonah. 
Jonah is mad when we meet him in the third chapter of his book. We see him sitting on a hill pouting that God has decided to spare the city of Nineveh from destruction. We see that the, like the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son, he's gnashing his teeth when the father welcomes the screwed up little brother home, right? We see that in the self-righteous Pharisees who are praying to God that they're not like the other guy, that sinful publican, not Republican, publican. In each story, God is the grace giver. In each story, the grumbler cannot understand that grace is right in front of them. Too often, we are so caught up in our grumbling and our driven nature to get merit and equality that we can't see grace when it's right in front of us, when it's smiling in our faces. In Nineveh, I want to go back to Jonah for a second. In Nineveh, Jonah's really angry, again, that God has accepted these Ninevites. And he was sent on a mission to destroy the Ninevites. He thought that was pretty clear. So he's mad that when God sees the people of Nineveh repent, turn away from their, their sinful ways, that uh, God has allowed that to happen, that God has accepted their repentance. So he goes out and he pouts. He pouts. He thought he was in a divine video game. He thought he was in the game in which God was going to blow up that 3D city. He thought that God was going to take care of things. And God challenges him and says, you know what? Look at you. You are angry. You just got mad at me for destroying the shade tree right here beside you. But you don't care at all for the 120,000 people that were really messed up and have turned their lives around. You don't care for their animals, who didn't know right from wrong to begin with. Who am I saved? I saved them all. And Jonah says in his messed up state, yeah, that's right. Who do you think you are? <laughs> Jonah can't see. He's so mad he can't even see that God is God, right? God can do what God can do. And he cannot accept the wideness of God's mercy. So my sermon title today is choose to be an anti-racist. And you may say, so you're talking about grace, you're talking about mercy. How did you get to the anti-racist conclusion? Well, I'll tell you how I did. We're living in some pretty messed up times, right? We're living in some pretty messed up times. And we can identify a lot with a place like Nineveh that's really messed up. But can we identify in the, these times when we see the grace of God and the mercy of God come in and make a difference? For example, it's really messed up in the West with the wildfires. Can we see that California has just signed into law that the men and women fighting the wildfires who are incarcerated inmates will, will get a degree for this? And when they get out of prison, they will have a job fighting fires, wildfires and city fires, if they have that. Can we see the grace in that? Can we see the grace in those who show up in boats in Biloxi, Mississippi, and in the panhandle of Florida today, in brigades of boats, saving people's lives as they've been hit by so much devastation from Hurricane Sally? Can we see that? Can we see that in the economic hardship, there are places and people that are opening their doors all over the place against all the wisdom of COVID-19 and its spread to offer themselves in love and mercy to those who have nothing? And can we see that men and women who dedicate their lives to turning around racism uh, have given us a better way to go? In his book, how to be an anti-racist. Dr. Kendi writes a few things that if you follow this path, you'll discover. He said, you'll discover what it takes to be an anti-racist. It's no longer good enough to say, I'm not a racist, and I agree with him. 
No one wants to say they are a racist, but it's not enough to say I'm not a racist. You have to say that I will fight racism. I will be an anti-racist. And he wants to show you that we should focus on policy rather than worrying all the time about changing people's minds. You know, we may change a few minds along the way, and there are tremendous stories of grace when it comes, but we need to change the policies that make racism real and continue its terrible path and destruction through uh, the African-American community across this country. And he says, you'll discover, if you become an anti-racist, why power and self-interest are what most racists use to build up their own life. There you go. So what if it was shared equally? What if we shared all of the things that we have equally so that it was an equal playing field? And he wants to point that out. And you'll also discover that our upbringing, the past generations, have influenced some really wrong ideas about racism. And that covers hundreds of years of generations, not just one, not just this current moment but going back all the way to 1619. So here we are. Today, I encourage you to live into grace. Today, I encourage you to stop worrying about the shade tree that got knocked down because God said you had to pay attention to the people who have been saved. I want you to pay attention to God's mercy. And I want you to figure out, along with me, how to walk the path toward a better world environmentally, toward a better world in the midst of this pandemic, and certainly toward a better world in relation to racism and becoming an anti-racist. We've got more to say, but that's enough for now. God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Amen. God be with you. And also with you. That there may be purpose and fulfillment, O oh God, in all that we do. Christ, that we may show others this day the love that you have taught us. Christ, that the church throughout the world may respond to your call for peace and justice. Christ, That those who are in need be helped and comforted. Christ, oh God, we pray this day for those in need of healing in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for the needs and concerns of this congregation, members, and family and friends who are listed in our Depart to Serve leaflet. And Lord, we pray this day for racial justice in this country. We pray for an awakening of those who have not been informed of the history that brings injustice in this country. We pray for our interpersonal relationships to be nurtured so that we may speak out in truth and love we pray also that we may ask for forgiveness where we may have been complicit in the works of racism and injustice. Work in us, O oh God, to heal our souls and work in us so that we may help those to heal our community and to heal our nation. With such division across our country along racial lines, may we speak out. May we work for these issues at the local level, even in our hearts, that we may be transformed by the knowledge that we have of the truth and by the knowledge we have that our actions can be used for good instead of harm. So wait, may we as a country and as a church respond to the issues that arise. May we be aware of what is needed for us to be a transforming community, an anti-racist community. And may you guide each and every one of us in our hearts this day and always.
We pray for those in our country, O oh God, who have died from COVID-19, for those who have um, loved ones who have died, and the ripple of grief that goes through our community and our nation. Help us to heal, O oh God. Help us to be aware of our neighbors in need. We pray for those who are recovering from surgeries or anticipating procedures, for those with new diagnoses or continued treatments. We ask, O oh God, that you continue to nurture the relationships when loved ones are in care facilities that cannot have visitors. We ask, O oh God, that you continue to um, be with us as we mourn the loss of loved ones, especially this week, the Anderson family, on the death of Alice Anderson, who's Dewan Cannon's sister and Eddie Anderson's mother. We lift to you now, O oh God, the prayers that we hold in our hearts. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. That we may be strengthened by your grace for the tasks of this day. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we pray for your guidance in all our days and by the power of the Holy Spirit, create in us care for each other as we walk in the path of truth and light. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our mission offering this morning goes to a mission very close to home. Here at First Congregational Church, each week we give a, a, take an offering for a mission that supports an issue of justice and mercy. This morning we take an offering to support the Good Samaritan Fund. Now this outreach ministry of First Church helps those who are in need with utility assistance, additional Kroger cards for food, um, and bus passes to get to work. So each week, Melody Lighthizer, or each month, Melody Lighthizer and Chris Brandt receive phone calls. This last month, they received over 65 phone calls and were able to help individuals in need of helping them stay in their home by helping to pay uh, rent, uh, sorry, helping to pay utilities, electric or gas or water. So this small step, this small step of mercy in our community helps people stay in their homes, and that can be transformative for people in our community. So we ask that you give generously to the continuation of the Good Samaritan program this month. The next Good Sam Day is October 12th. Please give generously.
communion elements close to you at home, we ask that you bring them closer so that we can partake in the sacrament together. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty this day? No matter who you are or what burdens you're carrying with you this day from the world that you live in, you're welcome at this table of grace. Come and be fed by these gifts that God has given us and that Christ has prepared. Let us pray. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth be glad, O oh God. We bless you for creating the whole world and for your promises to your people throughout the generations. We give you thanks for the gift of Jesus Christ. It is here at this table where you, O oh God, Pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of the bread and the cup so that we know of your love and your grace. Make these ordinary elements holy in your sight. Made whole by the brokenness of the bread, we would go to bring words of hope to all who have been told they are worthless, to strengthen all weakened by grief and loss. Watered by the goodness of the cup, we would offer compassion to everyone who has been hurt. We would carry hope to all those hearts that are emptied by despair. With thanksgiving, we take this cup and this bread and proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. As this is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Unite us in faith, encourage us with hope, inspire us to love that we may serve as your faithful disciples until we feast at your table in glory. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bread. Gathering around his friends, he gave thanks to God and he broke it. He gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink it, remember me. And as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. In preparing to depart, we as a faith community have heard the word and are called to respond and serve. There are many ways to serve our neighbors and this faith community during this time of pandemic. Watch your email, church website, and Facebook for updates concerning our faith community and how we will organize to help those in need during this time. 
Just a reminder, all worship will be online until further notice. No in-person worship. And please note all the virtual studies and meetings being offered this week. Faith formation has begun online with exciting opportunities for learning and growing in our faith. The pre-K through fifth grade Wednesday Connections will t is taking the form of a video posted on Facebook each week uh, on Wednesday for families to view at their convenience. And I think that Tootie and Rudy will be arriving again next week too. <clears throat> Youth Connections will be on Sunday evenings at 6.30 p.m. And our formative discussion for adults will be held throughout the week. Also, Reverend Dr. Tim Ahrens is leading a midweek, mid-morning, and Monday evening class on the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Complete details of dates and times for this study are listed in the Depart to Serve leaflet. Reverend Emily is making pastoral care lawn or patio visits on Thursday afternoons. To sign up, contact Pat Patterson to arrange a visit. All the details and time slots are listed in the Depart to Serve leaflet. If you need to be in touch with Reverend Aaron or Reverend Corzine for emergency pastoral care or name a prayer request, please call 614-733-4547. This number is listed in the Depart to Serve leaflet. Just a reminder, that your giving can be done through PayPal, Easy Tithe, or simply writing a check and sending it in the mail. No matter how you are giving, be sure to mark it for the mission of the week or to the regular church budget. If you have not done so, please like us on the First Church Facebook page. There will be numerous postings through this time for engagement, activities, and devotion. So please monitor your email, the church website, and Facebook page. You're invited to the virtual coffee hour after the service today. Uh, you may find the link in the Depart to Serve leaflet. Just click on the link and it will take you to the coffee hour. Let us sing the closing hymn as we depart with a heart to serve. Thanks be to God. with each other and reconcile our relationships with God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Thank you. 